test just one. Test, test one, test one, test one. get started. Where's that voice coming from? All right, doing double duty tonight, so just want to make sure everything's rolling properly. And we'll see if it does or not. If you'll excuse me just a moment. Uh, no. Um, so. Oh, well, that's weird, but we'll deal with it. That's what happens when you're uh, on the skeleton crew. Alrighty. Well, let's, uh, just before we get into our study for this evening, we'll take a look and uh, just look at some announcements, things that are coming up. Uh, we had a real good time Sunday night at our fellowship and uh, kind of good food, good, uh, good competition with the games. We had a good time with that too. Um, so... Um, Upcoming, we got a few other uh, gatherings and fellowships and things like that that are coming up. Uh, but every Wednesday night, our youth meet, our teens meet over in the youth building from 6.30 to 8. So while we're in here, they're in there. So um, if you happen to know of young people that might be interested in coming to our youth group, uh, they've usually got about 15 to 20 young people over there. So um, we uh, want to make sure that they get an opportunity to be challenged in uh, a setting uh, of their peers, so it's a great opportunity for that on Wednesday nights. Uh, our business for this month is Grandma Sally's. There are some cards out on the Welcome Center for you to take with you uh, when you go there. Again, those are just to let the, the business owner know uh, what it is that we're doing and what it is we're trying to accomplish. So if you get a chance to get over there this month, uh, take one of those cards with you. VBS is right around the corner, just a couple weeks away. If you still need some uh, information to be able to hand out, there is some right back there on those tables. Take that with you, pass it out in your neighborhood, um, give it to whoever uh, you think might be interested. Uh, it is ages, what's the youngest again? Two. Two, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, all right, so... Two years old and out of diapers. Maybe we should have just said three, but anyway. Um, so they need to be potty trained is what you're saying. And you're thinking that, and anyway, good luck with that. And uh, up to sixth grade is what we're looking at. So uh, great VBS, looking forward to that the last week of June. And uh, many of you are helping out with that, so... A um, few meetings are going to be coming up. You'll get some information about those as we get a little bit closer. Uh, but VBS is coming up. Uh, Tabernacle Tour, we have enough for that. Uh, we've got one. It's actually going to be next week, uh, a week from today. The first group will be going to uh, look at that tabernacle. And uh, that is an actual picture from there, just in case you're wondering. Uh, but it is a life-size replica of, uh, you know, according to the dimensions that were given in the Bible uh, of the tabernacle. Uh, you will thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, I've been there uh, with a previous group that we took, 
And uh, it's great. They send a, a guide, kind of walks you through and talks you through some of the different things that are there. Um, you will probably learn uh, quite a bit when it comes to some of the symbolism and things uh, with regards to uh, whether it's the furniture of the, the tabernacle or uh, just the layout of everything that was there. Uh, but it's a really neat thing. Uh, and even cooler, the fact that it's right in our backyard, just down in Tarpon Springs. So if, uh, even if you're not with that first group that goes next week, because uh, the tour groups are only about 10 or 12 people, uh, you can still sign up. And then uh, the next time we go, you'll be able to go with that next group. And we'll just keep sending groups as long as we have people signing up. That's kind of how we'll do that. Ladies Fellowship is this coming Tuesday. Uh, so the third Tuesday of every month, uh, Ladies Fellowship, 630. Uh, just arrive and find the group of ladies that's here. It's that easy. Uh, bringing food, right? Usually does everybody bring food, little snacks and things like that? All right. So uh, third Tuesday of the month, which would be next Tuesday at 630. All right. Well, let's go into uh, God's Word tonight, but let's begin with prayer. God, as we come to you, we are grateful for uh, the truth that your word holds for us, uh, I pray that you would guide us in your truth, uh, give us wisdom uh, as we try to understand um, from the Psalms uh, tonight, uh, Lord, what we need to know in order to live for you. Uh, Lord, a lot of it tonight has to do with a desire to uh, be near you, to draw close to you, to find our refuge and our hope in you. Uh, we just pray that you would uh, give us that hope, uh, Lord, and, and again, may we always look to you uh, rather than so many other things that we tend to look to uh, in our times of, of trouble. Uh, guide us tonight. Uh, we ask that you'd watch over uh, the youth as they meet, uh, be with their leaders, uh, Lord, a couple of them uh, dealing with some illness, so we pray that you would strengthen them. Uh, we uh, just pray that you would bless tonight and that your name would be lifted up in Jesus' name, amen. All righty, well, let's turn to Psalm 61. Psalm 61 is where we're at this evening. Once again, Psalms of Lament, so we're focusing on a certain type of psalm, and uh, we are not looking at every single one of the Psalms of Lament, so we're kind of skipping through those. Um, really just trying to land on the Psalms of Lament that are uh, that have some unique material for us uh, and that give us some, uh, some new information. Uh, just to kind of refresh you as well, the Psalms of Lament, these are not um, psalms to make you sad. Uh, that would be counterproductive. John? Thank you. That would be counterproductive to what we're trying to do, right? Uh, what David does in the psalms is he talks about praising God, right? And, and it's about exalting God's name. The psalms are songs, um, I, there's a lot of really negative and discouraging songs these days. Uh, I scratch my head when I hear them and find that millions and millions of people listen to them and like to listen to them, and they'll even pay to go to a concert where they can hear discouraging songs, and I don't understand. It's just me, I guess, maybe. Some of you are shaking your head, so it's not just me, but... Um, when we think about singing, uh, when we think about, uh, especially in, in the Scripture, the songs in the Psalms are worship to God. And so while these Psalms of Lament do carry those sorrowful, sad, sometimes uh, desperate elements, uh, they never end that way. There's always hope because God is in control, uh, and there's always hope because God is always there for us to look to no matter what the need and no matter what the trial or the difficulty or the challenge uh, or the opposition may be, and that's why we've, we've called this series, The Psalms of Lament, uh, Praise God at All Times, because we can always do that. We can always praise God. Uh, so tonight, as we look into Psalm 61, we are going to talk about hope that is greater than than me. Sometimes we try to figure out ways to uh, encourage ourselves. Our culture tells us that that's what you're supposed to do. Take care of yourself. Build yourself up. You got to build your self-esteem and you got to strengthen yourself and you've got to self, 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 self. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times the reason that we are in the predicaments that we are is because of us. Um, 
A lot of times the, the reason that we're in the mental state that we are or the discouraging position or, or a disposition of our mind that we are, a lot of times that is because that's all we've focused on is me, right? And I've set my mind on me and what I need and what I want and how I want things to be. And uh, usually that leads to discouragement because the rest of the world is not here for me right? <laughs> and we quickly find that out. But uh, again, the world has their way of, of trying to encourage you and to try to give you hope. And a lot of that has to do with you, you know, go out and do whatever you want to do, do whatever makes you happy. Uh, and again, build yourself up and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, David says, you know, I've got a different approach to this. David says, uh, I'm going to go to the one who is greater than me to find my hope. And ultimately, that's God. Uh, for David, there was no other place for him to find hope. And we search for it again. We, we search for it in books. We search for it in magazines. We search for it in uh, activities. We search for it. You know, we, we go after the, as, we, as I would say, the pleasures and the treasures of this life, trying to find hope, trying to find happiness. And, and we find that a lot of times those things just do not give us what we're looking for. However, God is a source of hope. As we look at it tonight, um, to find real hope, uh, we've always got to look to God, who is certainly greater than us. There's no question about that. Let's look at uh, Psalm 61. We'll read through it. Not a very long psalm, just eight verses. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Uh, the author of the psalm, it says, with stringed instruments of David, um, could mean by David, uh, for David, we're not 100% sure. Uh, I think our default is if we don't know who wrote it, we typically think David. Uh, but uh, we'll just refer to him as the psalmist this evening. Uh, but of course, it's not unlike uh, many of the other psalms in the way that it's written, uh, in the types of things that are said. And we even see a few psalms that are uh, very similar, uh, have similar phrasing uh, that's used. Uh, but again, the, the writer here is looking for hope. Um, this is an individual lament, so one person who is having uh, this difficult situation or circumstance, and uh, really there's some requests that are made in this psalm, and that's where we're going to find our hope or maybe our direction to find hope is to look at or really to ask God these certain questions, and uh, the author of this psalm makes some requests to God, and so we're just going to say, well, what requests can we make to God that show uh, our refuge is found in Him, you know, that show that we're looking to God for that refuge, for that hope, for that strength? What are some questions that we can ask God or some requests that we can make to God? And, and the psalmist opens with the first one. He says, hear my cry, O oh God. Our first thing that we can do, our first request that we can make to God is to say, hear me. <laughs> you know, hear me. And, and I've mentioned before, uh, we don't usually do that in our prayers, right? We'll pray uh, some address to God because that's what Jesus said in uh, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you know, when you pray, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So when we talk about praying, we don't usually start off by saying, hey, God, I want you to listen to me. Well, we just assume, since we're talking to God, and God always hears, that God listens, right? Uh, but so often we see in, in the Bible, especially in the Psalms, we see this uh, request to hear me. And again, not that David or the author of this psalm was necessarily using that in the process of his prayers, but he is writing that 
so that we know what he wants, right? I think when we pray, we all want God to hear us. Uh, Wouldn't it be silly to pray if we thought God didn't hear? And quite honestly, that's why a lot of people stop praying because they think God doesn't hear. And there's any number of reasons. Some people pray and because they don't get what they want, they think, well, there must not be a God, so I'm not going to try to pray to Him. Uh, Or some people pray for a while, and maybe sometimes they get something that they're asking for, and sometimes they don't. And so, uh, but, but the idea of praying to God with the thought that He's not listening would just be silly, okay? It it would really be a waste of time. Um, This call, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. This is, it's somewhat of a desperate call, really, if you look at what he says in verse 2. From the end of the earth, I call you, he says. From the end of the earth, I call you. Uh, I I think, uh, at least in in my opinion, maybe, uh, for the child of God, there is nothing worse than feeling far from God. Uh, There's a lot of bad things that happen in life. But when God is near, when we sense the reality and the closeness of God's presence with us, there's comfort, there's hope, there's nothing worse for the child of God than to feel as though God is not near. And I say feel because we actually talked about this in great detail back in Psalm 42, that there's just times when we feel as though God is far from us, although the reality is God is omnipresent for one, but God is always near. It's something within us that's causing us to feel as though we are far from God. As I said, it was Psalm 42, where David says, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, When shall I come and appear before God? That's just the beginning of David's lament saying, hey, I feel like I'm far from God. When am I going to get back into God's presence? When when am I going to be back in touch or close to God? So again, there's that desperation of of, of feeling. I mean, he says, I call from the ends of the earth. Uh, We're not flat earthers. At least I don't think we are. Um, you might be. Well, we can talk about that later. Um, there is no end, obviously, of the earth. It's an illustration, right? It's a picture that as far away as I can possibly be, if I was to go to the end of the earth, that's how far David says he's feeling at this moment. He goes on. He says, uh, he says from the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint, when my heart is is faint. When I'm worn out, when I'm tired. Uh, Now, here's the reason. If you look at verse 3, David says, just briefly, he says, you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. So, David's reason, if you will, for for running or for going wherever he has to the ends of the earth, uh, the reason for this, or even if it's just speaking spiritually, The reason for this is an enemy. There's someone who has caused David trouble. That's not always the reason why we feel far from God. Sometimes we're going to feel far from God because we are not turning toward God. Sometimes we're going to feel far from God because we've walked in our own way for a while, not really paying any attention to God. There's also times where trials come, right, where, where the God allows trials, and if we don't respond right to those trials, it's easy for us to feel like we're far from God because those difficult times, and again, we think of Job as an example, right, feeling far from God. No matter the reason, the result is usually the same, whether we've turned from God, whether there's someone who is making our lives miserable or persecuting us, or if, if God is allowing trial, the same thing is usually true. When we feel far from God, we feel exhausted. We are worn out. We feel as though we've got no energy. And again, we're not just talking about physically, we're talking about just spiritually. We are worn down and exhausted. Uh, 
I've seen there's uh, some of these survival shows where uh, they put a bunch of people in different remote locations, and they're supposed to kind of outlast each other in survival, right? You know, the kind of like the last one standing is the one who wins whatever prize they're giving them. Uh, and so what you have is you have people that are out there, and, and sometimes as they try to find the resources they need to live and to survive, they just don't find those resources. Uh, fortunately for them, and of course in the process, uh, you, you see that they get physically exhausted because their body isn't getting the nutrition they need. They get mentally and emotionally exhausted uh, in the process as well because they're far from civilization. They're far from the resources that they need to survive. Good news for them is that when they decide they want to quit, help is just a radio call away, you know, and the helicopter comes in and picks them up and takes them out of there. When we feel far from God, we are more exhausted every day. Um, But better than the helicopter coming to the rescue is the simple ability that we have to call on God for rescue. You know, when we call on God for rescue, that person that's in the remote wilderness and they call out for help, they're simply saying, I can't do this on my own. That's what they're saying. I can't survive on my own. When we call on God, we're saying a very similar thing. I can't do this on my own. That's why, you know, for a lot of us, we pray in the morning. Because we're going to start our day telling God, hey, I need your help. (laughs) Right? God, I need you to be at work today. Uh, That's why when we have a meal, we pray and, and we say, you know, God, without you, this food wouldn't be here. You've provided it, and I'm grateful for it. That's why before we do certain things, uh, we pray. That's why when we hear about a need or a a request that somebody has uh, or something that's happened, that's why we pray because in all of those instances, we're saying to God, I can't do this on my own. God, I need your help. And that's what David is doing. He says, I feel like I'm at the farthest reaches of the earth. God, I'm, I'm, I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. My, I, I'm, I'm fainting. My heart is faint. And he's calling on God because God is the one who can help. God is the one that he knows will help. I've got on the screen there for you that when I ask God to hear me, I show that I realize I can't do it myself. If you think about that, how many things do we go into throughout the day and maybe never think to pray about those things? Uh, And I don't want to say, I don't want to get uh, legalistic, if you will, and say that if you're not praying about it, then you don't care about God. But there's a lot of routine things I think that we do. You know, and the problem is, is that if we're not making it a regular habit to go to God, then we're going to find more and more things that we don't trust God for, you know? Uh, And so there's never, uh, there's never a point where you say, you know what, we just pray about way too many things. We need to back off a little bit. That'll never be the case, right? Because I think we all, if, if, again, if we're the children of God and we want God to be at work, we want God to be at work in everything, right? We want God to work in our lives all day, every day. So what we have to do is, is again, just simply acknowledge, God, we need you. And we do that by prayer. We do that when we call on God's name. Uh, it would be great if we didn't have to get to a point of desperation, <laughs> right? It'd be great if, if long before we felt like we were at the ends of the earth and so far from God that we decided, you know what? Hey, God, <laughs> I really need your help. That's when it should happen, sooner rather than later. So one of the things that we can say to God, one of the requests that we can make is, God, hear me. Hear me when I call. Hear me when I pray. The second one, we can say, lead me. God, lead me. Guide me is really what we're asking here. 
And David says that, or the author of this psalm says that in the middle of verse 2. He says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, he uses three, uh, three illustrations or three pictures. He says the rock, okay? David's not talking about a literal rock. Uh, he says, uh, you have been my refuge, okay, a place of safety. And then he says, and a strong tower. So a rock, a refuge, and a strong tower. We're thinking security and protection, right? That's what we're looking at. The question is, where is the psalmist here? He says, lead me to the rock, to the refuge, to the strong tower. Where is he wanting to be led? Christ, because you're thinking about the New Testament. <laughs> I know. We're, see, we're, we're post-cross Christians, right? So we always think about Christ. David, I don't think David, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't thinking about Christ, but you're going in the right direction, right? So he's thinking about God, right? That's the rock. That's the refuge. God. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Jesus is the rock of my son. Yeah, I don't, you know, there's a couple of problems we have with that song, so we're not even going to go there. That's, uh, that's like a, that's a weird Jesus song Solomon mix is what that is. But anyway, like I said, we're not going to go there tonight. Um, he wants, here's where, here's where the psalmist wants to go. He wants to go to God. Um, to, to put it more specifically, he wants to be in close proximity to God, right? He says, I'm at the far ends of the earth. I feel like I'm at the ends of the earth. Where do I want to be? I want to be at the rock, the refuge, the strong tower. And that's God. I want to be in. You know, <laughs> that's the great thing about the fortress. Um, it only works if you're in it. Right? Uh, it, it does you no good if you're stuck outside. Uh, the the uh, umbrella, you know, it, it doesn't do you any good if you're not underneath it, right? I told you about an umbrella that didn't work even though I was underneath it. That was a different sermon, a different illustration. But uh, the idea here for the psalmist is because I feel far away, I want to be guided back. Lead me, he says. Lead me to the rock. And sometimes, again, we get ourselves far from God as we try to lead ourselves. I want to lead my own life. I want to do my own thing. I want to go my own direction. And what we end up doing is walking far from God. David is saying, the author of this psalm is saying, God, lead me back to the safety of your presence. Here's the, here's the if you will, the proof of it. Psalm 18, verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. It's all about safety. It's all about security. It's all about protection. And that's not the only place that we see it. Psalm 62, verse 6, he only is my rock and my salvation. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength. Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. <laughs> Again, the author here, when he says, lead me to safety, lead me to protection, lead me to the refuge, he's saying, God, lead me to you. Bring me closer to you. The rock, he says, that is higher than I. Um, when the water's rising, you probably want to look for higher ground. <laughs> right? Uh, the rock that is higher than I. And we know that just in general, battle strategy, right? You know, you want to have the high ground because there's an advantage to the high ground. Uh, he says, lead me to this place of protection. And this protection, the reason it's so important is because it's greater than David. It's greater than the author of this psalm, and that's why we've kind of titled this hope that is greater than me, this rock that is higher than I, this source of protection that is stronger than me, that is greater than me. I mean, if, if, it, was, if it was just a little rainstorm or a few drizzles, you know, 
it might not be a big deal. We, we were out at the ball fields not too long ago and pulled in. It, it was like just as we're pulling in, it, it was that one day we had a little tornado over here somewhere and all that kind of stuff. And the rain was just blowing sideways and it was coming down. Uh, and, and we pull in and this uh, one of the guys that was there, uh, he pulls in with his truck and the wind started to blow the little topper that he had on the back of his truck, uh, started to blow it off. And he jumped out got soaked in about the two seconds he was out of the truck, and he put it back down. Then he jumped back in his truck, and he was going to back up and turn around and face the other direction, but before he could, the wind just took it right off the back of his truck. And so I got out and helped. Oh, man. Oh, soaking wet, soaking wet. It was just, it was terrible. Uh, but we tried to get the thing back on there. That was not a good shelter. It really wasn't. Um, that was not a safe place to be, a place of protection. It wasn't solid. It wasn't secure. David says, I want something that is better. Uh, my illustration here is uh, actually the picture that's on your screen. It's, it's, I, it's a picture I took. Uh, we were at St. Simon's Island in Georgia, and a really cool place. It's right on the Atlantic. And, and this was, you know, we were out there and it was kind of lower tide, obviously. And so you could see there's kind of like these pathways. You know, you can walk along the, the sand and then there's little tide pools all over. And we thought it was really cool. We ended up way out at that far one that you can see on the screen. That's where we ended up. And we're finding sand dollars. We're doing all kinds of stuff. I've got, you know, a couple of my kids, a niece and a nephew, and we're having a great time just exploring the ocean stuff. And the next thing I know, I look back over the ground that we've just covered, and there are almost no little pathways. <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh, we got problems. And, and so we are like, guys, we're going now. And so we start running, and we're, you know, and some of it we're even wading through. And I, it's hard to even see, you know, where the sand was because it was dusk anyway. Uh, if we had waited a few more minutes, we'd be swimming. Uh, that would have been the only way to get back, and it was, it was pretty dicey. I was, I was a bit nervous. Uh, nobody else knew that at the time because, you know, you got to be strong for the kids, right? But, you know, I was like, where's the sand? I don't see any sand, and it came up quick. Uh, that was a time, you know, you want to be led to safety. Uh, unfortunately, that job fell to me, so I didn't have a choice. But, um, but to be led to safety, to be led to security, that's what the author here wants, God, I've been so far away. I'm miserable. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I just want to be led back into safety. When we're not in a safe place, we need someone to guide us out. Often, it's too late for us to rescue ourselves when we finally realize, oh, I guess I need to call on God, right? And the old God help prayer comes out. Because, well, I'm in a mess. Um, calling on God to lead us to safety is often a desperate plea because we've gotten ourselves into some trouble. Uh, it would obviously be great to call on God sooner, as we said before. Uh, again, it'd be even better if we didn't get off track to begin with. If we stayed close to God to begin with, we wouldn't have to worry about being led back to the place of security, right? Um, when I ask God to lead me, I show that I plan to follow him to the safety that he gives. Now, it would be pretty silly, wouldn't it? If you said, you know, God, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a mess. I need you to lead me to a safe place. And then when God led you toward a safe place, you said, you know what, I changed my mind. If I'm going to say, God, lead me to safety, lead me to you, the rock, the refuge, the strong tower, what we're saying to God is, God, I want to be close to you. That's where we want to be. The last request that we're, we're looking at here is in verse 4, and, and I'm using the, the word keep, okay? Keep me, keep me. Uh, he says, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. And he says, prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. 
May he be enthroned forever before God, appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. Six and seven sound a little bit random, and that's okay. Uh, Prayers for the king were often random uh, because, you know, if you were a subject of the king, it was always good to throw in a little prayer for the king, (laughs) all right? So it's not a bad idea. Yeah, (laughs) right. So so here's, here's the, the, I guess there's a few phrases I want you to write down with this idea of keep me. Um, the first one I think that, you know, that, that the author uses here is keep me in your house. Okay, keep me in your house. Um, he says your tent. We could talk about the tent as in the tabernacle if we wanted to, but I don't know that that's necessarily the only thing that David is talking about. But he does say, keep me in your tent. Uh, quick question. If it's God's tent, who lives there? God. So what's he asking for? Just keep me close. <laughs> uh, God, I'd like to stay with you. I'd like to be in your presence. What an awesome desire. Uh, I love the last word of that phrase forever. Hey, God, I'll come visit you for a few hours. I'll come hang out at your house. I'll come hang out with you till I get bored. Yeah, that's how we do with people, right? No. David says, or the author of this psalm says, God, I want to be in your tent forever. I don't ever want to leave your presence. That's where I want to be. So keep me in your house. Uh, the, The second thing here, keep me under your wing. Keep me under your wing. He says in verse 4, let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. This is not the first time we've seen this illustration from David. Keep me safe under the shelter of your wings. Um, The idea here is a continual refuge that the author knows the only safe place is under God's wings. And, and so he doesn't want to go anywhere. You know, the, the idea that if, if I'm safe behind this shield from whatever is being thrown at me, why would I want to step out from behind it? You know, just asking for trouble, right? He's saying, God, I want to be, I want to be under your wing, and I think I'll stay there. This is the place I want to be. I want you to protect me. The only safe place is under God's wing. Uh, He also says, and this will be the third keep, if you will. He says, keep me, and I'm just going to phrase it this way, keep me in your family. Okay, if you look at verse 5, keep me in your family. He says, for you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of of those who fear your name. So heritage is where we get that family idea, right? Heritage, inheritance, okay? Um, Let me explain this. So he says, you've heard my vows. First of all, that word vows, um, we can think all kinds of uh, things like, well, I thought Jesus said we're not supposed to make any vows or we're not supposed to, you know. No, no, no. The word vows, this phrase here um, is is peace offerings, okay? That's what it, it, it literally is. You have heard Um, my vows, my peace offerings. In other words, he's saying, God, you know uh, that I have expressed my commitment to you. That's what he's saying. That's what you would do with a peace offering is two people are making peace. The end result of that peace when it came to a peace offering is that the two individuals involved, uh, at least when it came to the Levitical law, it would be the person who had done wrong and God, they actually would sit down and eat The peace offering, Uh, the the person who had sinned against God uh, would eat part of that peace offering, uh, kind of symbolizing that we are, now that we're on good terms, we can have a meal together. And that's what he's saying here, is he's saying, you have heard my vows. God, you know that I am uh, on good terms, if you will, on good terms with you. And then he says, Keep me, uh, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. He's not saying you have taken from someone and given to me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the same heritage or inheritance that those who fear your name have, you've also given that to me. So all David is saying is I'm part of the family. 
Well, what family is he really talking about here? He's talking about the Israelites who are faithful to God. So what he's saying when he, when he makes this statement, he is saying, God, I want you to keep me in your family. This is where I want to be. I'm glad to be in your family. Um, that should extend to other family members as well. I'm glad to be with those other family members who are in your family. So the writer is saying, keep me in your family. The, the fourth keep in this uh, section here is uh, I, I'm going to say, keep me in your promise. Keep me in your promise. Because what he does, and that's where we'll talk about this prayer for the king, prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. Is there any king whose years are going to endure to all generations? Oh, now's the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> You had it, you had it. No, it's good. Right, Jesus. So what, what did God promise to David? What was the Davidic covenant about? The throne forever, right? That there would always be someone of his heritage, his lineage on the throne. And, and all he's saying is, God, I just want you to keep me in your promise. That promise that you made, God, I want you to do that. May he be enthroned forever before God. Um, I kind of getting goosebumps just a little bit thinking about Christ on the throne forever. You know, when we say what a day that will be, that will, that'll be the day, okay? That'll be the day, and we long for that. We look forward to that. He says, um, now, now here's how that happens, if you will. Um, it's going to happen because of what we see in verse 7, appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. How are God's promises going to be kept? Well, they're going to be kept through his steadfast love and faithfulness. Because God doesn't change because the things he promises he will do, the writer here is able to say, you know what, God, keep me in your promises. Keep me in your promise. Um, the desire of David's heart is to be as near to God as possible because it's a place of comfort, safety, inheritance, and assurance. First thing that came to my mind when I thought about this was uh, the prodigal son. And I know we've used him as an illustration not too long ago, but, but if you think about the prodigal son, he went away from his father and his family. He was destitute, he was homeless, he was helpless, and at some point he realized a longing to be back in the presence of his father, a longing to be in the presence of his father, a longing to be in the safety of his home. Now, he had already squandered his inheritance, so he wasn't even thinking about that but he had the assurance that even if he went back to his father's home to be a servant, that he would be in a good place. The place we should want to be is as near to God as we can possibly be. Because that's, again, that's where comfort, safety, inheritance, and assurance happen. Some questions that maybe you need to just think about. Do we want to be close to the presence of God? Or are we simply just wandering in our own direction? Do we want to be under His wings? Or do we want, as our culture says, to spread our own? Do you want the inheritance that God has for you? Or are you wanting the temporary pleasures and treasures of the world? Are you taking advantage of the assurance that God gives us that He will keep us, that He will protect us? Uh, what I mean by that is taking advantage in a negative way. Uh, it seems that a lot of times there are believers who say, you know what, I kind of want to do my own thing. I want to do it my own way. And, you know, I know that no matter what I do, God is right there. And so, you know, I can always go back to Him. It's called taking advantage. 
of something and, and ultimately taking advantage of the grace of God and the assurance that God gives us of his faithfulness. On the screen, it just says, when I ask God to keep me, I show that I want to remain as close to him as possible. Uh, we haven't looked at verse 8 yet, so we'll just glance there. It's, uh, it just says, so I will ever sing praises to your name. Uh, the sense here is that, you know, when I'm in a good place with God, it's a reason to rejoice. It's a reason to praise him. I will ever sing praises to your name. And then he says again, as I perform my vows, so that same phrase that we looked at earlier, this idea of the peace offerings, I will perform my vows day after day. In other words, um, I, I will remain in fellowship because, you know, we're, we're at peace. He says, I will remain in fellowship with God. Uh, God is our rescue. In times of trouble, God is our rescue. He's our guide back to the safety that He gives. When He keeps us, we're secure in Him now and, as our author says here, forever. Uh, are you wandering? Not wondering, are you wandering? Are you roaming around on your own, not looking to God for wisdom, for direction, for protection, for strength, for provision? Are you moving from God or are you moving toward God? These simple things that our author said, hey, hear my cry, O God. Lead me to the rock. Let me stay with you. Keep me, O God. These simple things show a desire of our heart to want to be close to God. I don't know where you look in your time of need. Hopefully, not to uh, the wisdom of the world. Unfortunately, at best, the wisdom of the world doesn't get any smarter than people. Okay? Hopefully, you're not looking within yourself <laughs> for hope and for answers Look to God. Look to God. Long to be in the presence of God. Not only to get there, but to stay there in the presence of God. Call on God. Follow where God leads. And again, remain in His presence. Remain close to Him. Questions, comments, thoughts? Anybody at all? Hmm? Praise the Lord. All righty. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Was that a psalm of lament, by the way? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no, no. You said we go to New York State, and I just asked if that was a psalm of lament. <laughs> joke. But you were saying. All right, right. And I was like, I was angry. You know, I'm like, chill out, dude. <laughs> but he, he sees, he sees so many miracles. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, right, yeah, and that's the value. It's the value of being around God's people. Um, there's a great comfort there. There's a reminder of God's presence there when we're gathered with God's people. Um, we can still be sure of that, even when we're not able to gather with God's people. Maybe different if we're, if we're avoiding, you know, that's a different story. It's one thing if I can't get together with God's people for some reason. It's a different story if I can, but I don't want to or I choose not to. Uh, I, think, I think you're going to sense even faster the absence of God's presence, you know, with you. 
Um, but yeah, so uh, praise God as we continue to pursue Him, as we call on Him, as we ask Him to lead us, you know, back. Uh, he does that. He does that faithfully. Yeah, he Amen. <laughs> Good. That's great. That's great. Anybody else? Mm, right. Sure. Well, in that sense, we just say he knows what it feels like, yeah. right? You know, where where we know that Christ understands. You know, he's experienced all the things that we have, of course, without sin, as the scripture says. Uh, but he knows. He knows what that's like. Sure. It never is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It never is the fact that God has walked away, but we uh, we drift, we drift. Yeah. All righty. Well, let's go ahead. We'll uh, well, let me see if there we go. All right, we'll go ahead and move to our time of uh, prayer tonight. So, if you have your prayer request sheet with you, pull that out right now.